A bridge collapse at a suburban Mumbai train station leaves five injured, two critically so. Just months ago, the railway minister had promised safety audits of footover bridges after 22 people died at Elphinstone. The government's move exempting political parties from scrutiny of funds received through foreign contributions is now under legal challenge. The Supreme Court issues notices. How, how many of you? 13. And it's not a happy ending yet for the 13 members of a Thai football team found alive after a relentless nine-day multi-nation search. It could be a while before they are brought out. It's Wednesday, July 4th. How often have you heard the lament that all political parties are the same? While that's not entirely true, it is a fact that bitter political rivals very often collaborate for mutual benefit. We're not talking about uneasy alliances. We are referring to the amendment brought, arguably slyly, to the FCRA, or the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act. The Supreme Court has now issued notice on a petition filed by the Association of Democratic Reform challenging the amendment. What is the FCRA amendment? Let's start in 2014. The Delhi High Court, in a landmark judgment, found the BJP and the Congress as having taken foreign funding, thereby violating the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act and the Representation of Peoples Act. The court asked the government and the Election Commission to act against the two political parties for accepting foreign funds from Vedanta and its subsidiaries. The judgment noted that the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act of 1976 was enacted by the Parliament to serve as a shield in our legislative armory and to insulate the sensitive areas of national life like journalism, judiciary and politics from extraneous influences stemming from beyond our borders. It will be informative to note how alleged foreign funding in a domestic political process can influence decisions of governments by looking at the Sri Lanka example. As this New York Times investigation, how China got Sri Lanka to cough up a port, reveals. In the 2015 Sri Lankan election, at least $7.6 million was dispensed from a Chinese company China Harbour's account to affiliates of Mr. Rajapaksa's campaign. Large payments from the Chinese Port Construction Fund flowed directly to campaign aids and activities of Mr. Rajapaksa, who had agreed to Chinese terms at every turn and was seen as an important ally in China's efforts to tilt influence away from India in South Asia. So what happened after the Delhi High Court judgment? In 2016, the government quietly inserted an amendment in the Finance Bill with the aim of shielding the BJP and the Congress from having violated the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act by accepting donations from Vedanta. The amendment redefined foreign companies in the FCRA Act in such a manner that Vedanta and companies like it came to be defined as Indian companies. In effect, making it okay for the BJP and Congress to have taken money from it. In 2018, the government further amended the FCRA to allow political parties to be exempt from scrutiny of funds they have received from abroad since 1976, essentially allowing for the amendment to be applied retrospectively. Just to be clear, the two parties were found to be in violation of political financing laws for four decades, so the government of the day decided to retrospectively amend a law to wipe the slate clean. No wonder the 2018 amendment was described by some as the get-out-of-jail card. Now, the Modi government has claimed to want to clean up campaign finance and in its 2017 budget announced the following. The limit for cash donations to political parties was brought down from 20,000 to 2,000. Critics argued that if earlier a proposed cash donation of say 1 lakh rupees was divvied up into five smaller contributions of 20,000 each to stick with the letter of the law while avoiding a trail, the new rule will only make it a little more cumbersome. The other announcement was the issuance of electoral bonds. An entity wanting to make a contribution to a political party can purchase bonds that will be issued in multiples of 
thousand rupees, ten thousand rupees, one lakh, ten lakh, and a crore rupees at branches of the State Bank of India. The entity can donate the bond to their party of choice, which can be cashed by the party within fifteen days. But the measure that was touted to bring transparency, the Election Commission argued, could in fact make the process more opaque. The Election Commission told a parliamentary committee that electoral bonds introduced by the government is a retrograde step. It said the changes would compromise transparency in political funding. How, you ask? The amendment in Section 29C of the Representation of Peoples Act 1951 makes it no longer necessary to report details of donations received through electoral bonds. Basically, contribution reports of political parties need not mention names and addresses, etc., of those contributing by way of electoral bonds. And since the parties don't have to file details of contributions received through electoral bonds, the Election Commission will not know of it, and will in turn not be able to display it on their website as it had been doing for people to know. A bridge used by thousands of commuters every day in the suburban Mumbai train station and Dheri collapsed following incessant rains early Tuesday morning. Five people were injured, two critically. In September last year, fears that a portion of a footover bridge at Elphinstone Road was giving way resulted in a stampede, killing 22. Under fire, the railway ministry had promised to extend the footover bridge at Elphinstone and conduct an audit of all footover bridges. Here are some numbers that tell the story of Mumbai's suburban railway network. Every year, more than 3,000 people die. That statistic is explained away by the rather benign sounding word, overcrowding. Consider this, the suburban network has an estimated maximum capacity of 1,80,000 commuters per hour. In reality, as many as 3,60,000 commuters travel per hour, packed like sardines during peak time. Peak travel time lasts three and a half hours in the morning, three and a half hours in the evening. Now, imagine these numbers trying to exit the railway station or crossing over to another railway line using these British era footover bridges. To underscore the point on misplaced priorities, one only needs to listen to the man who knows what he's talking about, E. Sridharan. India's metro man said, bullet trains will cater only to the elite community. It's highly expensive and beyond the reach of ordinary people. What India needs is a modern, clean, safe and fast railway system. If you thought air pollution was just affecting your lungs, heart and skin, think again. Even low levels of air pollution have been found to be a cause of type 2 diabetes. This study by Lancet has shown that air pollution contributed to 32 lakh or 14% of all new diabetes cases in 2016 by reducing the secretion of insulin in our bodies. Our pancreas secrete a hormone insulin which converts sugar in our bloodstream to energy for use by cells. In diabetes mellitus type 2, the secretion of this insulin is interrupted or greatly reduced which leads to high blood sugar and low energy. Typically, diabetes type 2 has been thought to be hereditary or caused by life factors such as obesity, lack of exercise and poor diet. However, for years, scientists have struggled to explain the prevalence of the disease in healthy people. This study offers a plausible explanation. Lancet observed 17 lakh healthy US veterans with no history of diabetes for eight and a half years and found suspended air particulate matter enters the bloodstream and triggers inflammation. This prevents the body from secreting insulin and converting blood glucose into energy. The researchers also found that the overall risk is more in lower income countries like India, Afghanistan, Papua New Guinea and Guyana. It is especially worrying for India that is home to 14 of the world's 20 most polluted cities. How many of you? 13? Brilliant. No, not today. Not today. It's two of us. You have to die. It's been a remarkable nine days for these 12 members of a Thai football team and their coach. But their ordeal is far from over. 
The boys were located on a 2 meter high shaft in the flooded Thung Luang cave on the border of Laos and Myanmar. We told you yesterday, but bringing them out could take months. The only way out is a swim through the cave's narrow, silted and mucky passageways. But the swim took highly trained navy seals 6 hours, and these 13 can neither swim nor dive. Another alternative drilling down the mountain into the cave has proven to be implausible. The best bet seems to be for the boys to walk out after the water level in the cave recedes. But hungry, disheveled and weak, the 13 boys have survived all odds, and we're sure it'll be only a matter of time before they emerge with the story of their life. Stay tuned. We'll see you tomorrow.